So I am a trauma surgeon by nature and by training. Uh, I, this is not a scientific talk as, as perhaps the others you've heard this morning. I'll confess that I was hanging out in the back of the room talking to Dr. Kroos, who is a bad influence, and so if my language gets a little um, colorful during the course of this, I apologize. Please blame Martin. Why would a guy be given a talk on domestic violence? Well, uh, in my many travels, I was uh, at the University of South Florida for a couple years. To keep your license in Florida, you have to do uh, domestic violence related CME every two years. And uh, the guy that did it there was Ron Ches, great guy, OBGYN. And he wasn't a big believer until he went to a conference and they said, go home to your own practice and ask some of your patients. And he picked the patient he thought was safest in his practice, a woman he'd known 20 years, delivered three of her kids, and he said, well, you know, have you ever had any problems with this? And she said, yeah, last week wasn't bad, he only hit me three times. And, and that was his index case. And I went out and made rounds, and, and there were a bunch of uh, domestic violence uh, on the trauma service there and like Ron says, everybody's got their own index case. Mine is this person. Graduate student, divorced, a uh, couple of kids, married another grad student. I'm going to get this clicker to work or I'm going to break it. Let's try the other one now. So within a year, there was psychological, uh, verbal, and physical abuse. She got hit, showed up at the emergency department, uh, got questioned about abuse, but the guy was there, and she said absolutely not. Got some facial injuries from time to time, and eventually was hospitalized and had major facial reconstructive surgery. Okay. Your electronics hate me. Eventually they got divorced, uh, never reported. Come on. 15 year course, not atypical, no terribly bad outcome. So the scope of this is, is tremendous. Uh, it was estimated to be the leading cause of serious injury for women, second leading cause of injury and death. Everett Koop described the rate of injury from battering as greater than motor vehicle crash and mugging. It's been going on forever. Um, found this uh, quote in the Harvard Law Review. When you see your wife commit an offense, don't rush her with insults and violent blows. Scold her sharply, bully and terrify her. This is a scholar. Uh, and if this still doesn't work, take up a stick and beat her soundly, for it is better to punish the body and correct the soul than to damage the soul and spare the body, not in rage, but out of charity. Yeah. And concern for her soul, so the beating will rebound to your merit and her good. Really? Um, the title of this talk, Rule of Thumb, uh, this is somewhat controversial. It's folklore. However, in 1782, there was a judge's proclamation from Great Britain that said the husband could beat his wife as long as the stick he used was not thicker than a man's thumb. For those of you that have used the term rule of thumb, now you know where it came from. Uh, this has been upheld in British law and is reiterated as recently as the last century in London. We're not a whole lot better. Uh, we didn't abolish the right of men to beat their wives until 1871. Until the 1970s, if you beat up your wife, it was a misdemeanor, or if you did it to your neighbor, it was a felony. Uh, in 92, the joint, now I'm not a big fan of the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Hospitals, but this is one of the things they did that I think was uh, landmark and, and, and helpful. Hasn't been carried out very well, but, but nonetheless, they did do it. Come on. There you go. Uh, a definition of domestic violence, the research in this has been a little bit hampered by multiple different definitions. This definition works uh, and is pretty useful. Uh, physical abuse is what's most reported, but much like a lot of other interpersonal crimes, it's probably less than half of what really happens. So there are some myths that it's infrequent, not true, and I'll get to that in a minute, that it's limited to certain women, batters are easy to identify, that it's a private matter. Well, it's, it's hidden because there's a lot of shame and humiliation that's associated with it, but it shouldn't be considered prime. It's not caused by drinking and drugs. A lot of the people that are victims get into drinking and drugs to, to numb it up a little bit. Um, battered women can just leave is a big one. Everybody says, well, why didn't she just leave? Why didn't she just go away? And the answer is you can't. You're not just divorcing him, you're divorcing your, your life. You have to leave town. One of the women that works in our med staff office uh, 
was abused by her husband, went into an emergency department uh, basically in, in, uh, with a concussion, and they said, were you in a car crash? And she fessed up. Uh, husband went to jail for the weekend, got out, and beat her within an inch of her life. She actually wound up moving around for two years, did not even tell her parents where she was because he was constantly harassing her parents for her location. So the reality is the woman is battered in this country every 10 seconds. This talk is going to go for 40 minutes. You can do the math. There's no distinction for age, race, culture, status, class, education, or religion. I gave this talk one time in Virginia, and a woman in the audience got up and, and described her friend who had been stalked by her husband. Their son had gone to their marriage counselor and said, I'm really worried for mom. Dad just bought a shotgun. Um, and the marriage counselor said, don't worry, Jewish men never kill their wives. Two days later, she was shot down in the parking lot of her, of her employment, which happened to be the Central Intelligence Agency. Women run a 24 to 54 percent cumulative lifetime risk of battering. I have a 14-year-old daughter. Uh, this is of great concern. Child abuse in about 60 percent of the wife abuse families. Severity gets worse over time. Gets worse after you leave. Another reason women don't tend to leave. They're afraid of getting killed. Uh, cause of 19 to 30 percent of ED visits, 33 to 50 percent of female homicides, domestic violence, and 25 percent of suicide attempts. One of my colleagues from San Diego, Dr. Seiss, uh, was the COT Prevention Committee Chair for a while. He said, oh, we got to do something about suicide. I said, Mike, do something about domestic violence and you'll do a lot about suicide. So women of all races are equally vulnerable to violence, 5.3 million every, 12, every year. More than four women a day are murdered in this country by a boyfriend or husband, four a day. One in three women beaten, coerced into sex or otherwise abused during their lifetime. Uh, a brief note about the military, rates are very high. It's linked very strongly with uh, PTSD. It is lower in the group of, in the military that doesn't have other psychopathology, and it doesn't work for, the treatment doesn't work very well for active duty service personnel because they keep getting moved around. Uh, how about kids? I've got a daughter in high school and a son in high school. One in five high school students report being physically or sexually abused by a dating partner. One in three say they know somebody, friend or peer, who's been hit, punched, slapped, choked, or physically hurt. Interestingly enough, 75% of them will say, if I know that this is happening to a friend of mine or to me, I'll report it to a counselor, to a friend, somebody. The fact is only about 17% ever do. Abused girls are significantly more likely to engage in other high-risk behavior, more likely to get pregnant, a lot more likely to try and kill themselves. It's a huge problem. Uh, pregnancy. Uh, frequently, uh, the first time it happens uh, during pregnancy, you can do the math, 324,000 women every year <clears throat> suffer domestic violence as part of their pregnancy. It's more common than, than some of the other complications that we study in medical school, and it's a marker for a very dangerous relationship. You can see where the math comes from. It gets worse as the pregnancy goes on, perhaps as the tension in the home goes up. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that. This was described actually back in the Journal of the American Medical Association two decades ago. Uh, there's a, a tension building phase, name calling, intimidation, the second phase with discharge, explosive, uh, physical attack, and frequently injury, and then the, the hearts and flowers phase. Geez, I'm really sorry. Things were very stressful at work. I had too much to drink. It won't ever happen again. Honey, I love you. Um, and the victim wants to believe this. So there's a second cycle that I blame on, on us. In one study of battered women, 23% had been into the ED six to 10 times prior. How often would you go back to a mechanic if you took your car to him six times and he didn't fix the problem? 20% had 11 prior emergency department visits before they figured out what the source was. When we looked at this, and I have an interest in this, the chairman of the Department of Emergency Medicine at my hospital is married to the executive director of the shelter in my town. You could say there's high level interest in domestic violence in, at our hospital in the trauma and emergency department. We had one woman a day who came in 
with document of assault. One woman who had multiple lacerations to her hands from her boyfriend with a knife discharged in, with him home. No referral made. We only had two referrals made in the entire month, and one of them was because the abuse happened in front of the kids and they wanted to make sure the kids were going to be safe. Really? Um, no referrals to law enforcement. California is a mandatory reporting state, just like for child abuse. Two referrals, or actually none. So we're not alone. We're really bad at this as a, as a profession. Physicians identified one in 35 as battered when looking at it, it was more likely to be one in four. In cases with known domestic violence, no response at all by doctors in 40% and no referral in 92%. Physicians suck at this. Okay? If you ask women who's helpful to you, doctors are less effective than everybody else, including the lawyers. Pathetic. Why? Partly because it's uncomfortable. Partly because non-trauma complaints sort of make it. And these women get viewed as frequent flyers. Oh, it's Mrs. Smith. She's back in with irritable bowel syndrome or vague abdominal pain or headaches. Uh, only about 13% will actually volunteer, but and the obvious signs are relatively rare. But if you ask them, usually they'll tell you. There are some physical clues. I fell down the stairs, except all the injuries are, are isolated to face and center mass and there's nothing on the extremities. Probably ought to think again. Patients don't volunteer, but if you ask them in an unjudgmental fashion, they'll fess up. Failure to ask, in fact, is perceived as evidence that you know and you just don't care enough. So how do you make the diagnosis of this? And I'll argue for routine, explicit screening. Ask a question without the partner present. There are two very good screens. This is the one that we've put on our trauma H&P form. Have you been hit, kicked, punched, or otherwise hurt by someone in the last year? If so, by whom? Do you feel safe now? Is there somebody from a previous relationship making you feel unsafe? Three questions takes you 20 seconds. If you don't want to spend all 20 seconds, Spend five and ask the first question. It's got about an 85% hit rate. The abuse assessment screen is essentially the same. Adds four sex, adds uh, abuse during pregnancy. If you compare these, uh, this was a study that was done at an OB clinic looking at specific screening versus spending an hour with social services doing a routine intake. And what we found out is explicit questioning was a whole lot better. Four times more likely to find out a history of domestic violence, five times more likely to tell you if there had been recent violence, ten times more likely to tell you if there had been violence during pregnancy. A lot better to ask specific questions, just like for everything else we do in medicine. So one of the reasons doctors don't ask is because they don't know what to do. And physicians like to know what to do. I mean, that's why we go to medical school and all those other things. It's pretty easy. Treat the medical problems. Reassure the patient. Determine whether there's immediate threat. And then you get to hit the referral button, which is kind of like the Staples Easy button. And, and social services is supposed to take care of the rest of it, and you've done your job. Document it in the medical record. That's it. But you've got to make the diagnosis. If you don't make the diagnosis, really bad things happen. In one study of women that were murdered, 44% of those had presented to an emergency department within two years of their deaths. They averaged over three visits per victim. We had three shots to make the diagnosis. Injury was documented on at least one encounter and 93% domestic violence documented in only 2% of these patients. No intervention ever made. Another study. 11 different cities, 81% had been abused within a year prior to being murdered. 81%. 72% had been reported harassment or stalking. 66% had accessed the health care system. And all these women from both these studies have the same thing in common. They're all wearing toe tags. And we had a chance to make a diagnosis and missed it. So uh, I told you it's not uncommon. The slide is actually added. It is four now. When I first did this talk back in 08, it was three every day. Now it's four. Um, and we include the murder-suicides. There are common stories in the, in the media 
about people who go home, murder their entire family, annihilate everybody. Um, victims of dom domestic violence, there are some cues. They use more medical care, primary care and ED visits. They get more prescription drugs. They have more hypertension. They have more somatic complaints, headache, ulcers, irritable bowel syndrome. They're at risk for depression, for PTSD, for substance abuse, and yes, indeed, suicide. And you ought to think about all those things when you have those patients. I'm going to depart a little bit and talk about some other things. 71% of battered women report that their pet was threatened, harmed, or killed. 85% of shelters indicate that women seeking safety described incidents of pet abuse. And there are people that, in fact, don't leave because he's going to kill the dog if I do. At our shelter in Fresno, California, we had a woman that left with her two kids. She was there. The husband showed up with a box, the family dog, a rope, and a blowtorch. Put the dog on the box, put a rope around his neck, hung it from a pole, and was fixing to fricassee the dog in front of the family. About that time, the police department showed up. So the pet was saved and not burnt. Uh, I regret to inform you they did not put him on the box and fricassee him, but it was, you know, a reasonable thought. So <clears throat> I'm going to argue that domestic violence is pervasive within our society. There are jokes that are told. It's acknowledged but not commented on. I take that one out. Yeah, I took that one out. Um, when I was... Uh, a young attending, I had one of the nurses come in the room and say, hey, you want to hear a joke? And I said, sure. She said, well, what do you tell a woman with two black eyes? I said, mm -hmm. so nothing. You already told her twice. Some of you have heard that joke before. Uh, we don't do very well. Uh, there are reports of domestic violence in our newspaper and our media. Uh, occasionally something's horrific enough that we get interested in it, but not commonly. How many of you remember the, the woman who had the first face transplant? Remember her? She had her face taken off with a shotgun uh, by her husband because he was leaving her, or she was leaving him, excuse me. It's not publicized like other crimes. With all apologies to Dickens, a tale of three murders, if I can get my remote to work. One in Texas, one in Laramie, and one in Denver. Come on. There you go. So in Jasper, Texas, 1998, James Bird accepted a ride from three guys. He knew one of them. They beat him up, tied a chain around his waist, and dragged him behind a pickup truck. They dumped his body uh, at the local black cemetery and went to a barbecue. At autopsy, he, it was determined that he was alive for much of this. He died after his arm and head were severed when he hit a culvert. Uh, two of the guys were known members of a white supremacist group. It was prosecuted as a hate crime. All three were convicted of first-degree murder. Two were sentenced to death, one to life in prison. One actually got executed last September. In Laramie, uh, Matthew Shepard met two guys at the Fireside Lounge. They gave him a ride. Uh, they robbed him, pistol-whipped him, tortured him, and, and tied him in a crucifixion pose on a, on a barbed wire fence. Uh, he never regained consciousness. He died. They, uh, they used the gay panic defense. Since he was gay, if he touched them, they might get the gay. Uh, that didn't go very well. They both got two consecutive life sentences, essentially life in prison without parole. So in 2006, the naked body of a young woman was found uh, in a subdivision outside of Denver. She had been dragged behind a, a Toyota. Uh, with the tow rope around her neck for more than a mile, leaving a trail of blood and tire marks. Um, to describe that, the people in the subdivision were extremely upset because the city of Denver was unable to scrub the road to get the stains out of the road. They actually had to finally resurface it. Uh, at autopsy, she died from, from uh, asphyxiation or head injuries. They used fingerprints to make the, the ID. She was Luz Maria Franco Fierros. She was an undocumented immigrant, worked three jobs to support her kids back in Mexico. The guy she was living with was arrested and charged with murder. And in 2009, he, was, he uh, cut a plea deal. Just as a comparison of coverage, James Byrd, 5,190,000 stories, crimes denounced by civil rights leaders, Foundation for Racial Healing, there's been a movie, there's been a documentary. Uh, the James Byrd Hate Crimes Act was uh, signed into law in, in uh, 2001. 
Matthew Shepard, almost two million stories. Crimes have been denounced by gay rights groups, civil libertarians. 2020, there's songs, there's three films and a play. The Matthew Shepard Act became law in 2009. And for domestic violence, we have, if I can get the advancer to work, come on, there you go. Initially about 400 stories, now about 38,000 hits on uh, Google search. There's been no impassioned condemnation by national civil rights leader, no foundation, no made for TV movie, no documentaries, no legislation. There's an online collection for funeral costs and her body was repatriated to Mexico so she could be buried in the town where her daughters live. Something of a difference. TV and movie studios include stalking, rape, and murder regularly. I Google search movies and rape. 89 million hits in less than a quarter of a second. Including one site that advertises the most brutal free real rape movies on the internet, as though this is entertainment. And I guess for some people it might be. If you look at it somewhat more scientifically, and I appreciate that social sciences are a little soft for most of it, so it's not something that we can measure quite uh, as strongly. Took a group of men, <clears throat> one group watched movies every day that uh, portrayed violence against women. And the stuff that they initially said was uh, violent and degrading to women, by the end of a week, not so much. Uh, the ones that said, yeah, this is making me really uncomfortable to watch, by the end of a week, not so bad. Uh, and, and in fact, they said they enjoyed it more the more they watched it. They then took that group versus the group that didn't watch those movies and did a mock rape trial. And the guys that watched the, the Violence Against Women movies felt that the, the woman, the victim, was less injured and they didn't have as much empathy towards rape victims in general. There's been a lot of talk about rape in the press recently. Same effects, by the way, were observed by women who did the same thing. Come on. The entertainment industry says it's not real violence. It has no effect on behavior. They don't know what all the excitement is about. This is the same group that took over $2 million for a 30-second Super Bowl ad to convince you to eat their Doritos or take their erectile dysfunction tablet or whatever. Uh, and they, I'm sure they're spending that kind of money because they don't think it has any effect on your behavior. But a two-hour movie doesn't. Um, for those of you that don't recognize these movie posters, Kill Bill is, is just domestic violence every which way but loose. Um, the other one is uh, for the, th the 300, which is the epic battle of the Spartans at Thermopylae. Uh, and there's a scene where the, the Spartan queen is, is essentially raped by one of the, one of the uh, pretenders to the throne, and as he's forcing her into sex, he says, you will not enjoy this and it will not be over soon. And that's one of the ways they chose to advertise that movie. There have been a bunch of movies that have come out with domestic violence in them. You can read through this uh, as well as I can. Kindergarten Cop, even. This is actually a uh, somewhat deleted screen from Grand Theft Auto 4. And what does the three-way have to do with Grand Theft Auto 4? I'm glad you asked. I have not a clue. Uh, the main character runs the hooker over with his car and gets more points. Uh, they sold six million in the first week. Over 22 million have been sold. This came up in a discussion on NPR where they were talking about whether or not violence in the media has effect on the behavior. And they had somebody from the industry who was very polished and somebody you could hear the tweed in his voice from the university. And they were going back and forth and it was all very entertaining. And then a woman called in and said, look, I've been married for four years to this guy. Love my husband. He got this damn game. Every time he goes in and plays it for a couple hours, I don't like the way he talks to me. I don't like the way he treats me after he plays this game. I'm going to go home and I'm going to throw the damn thing away. I thought it was the most articulate point made during the entire discussion. If you look at young adults over a 15 year period and you stratify them by high or low TV violence viewing, those that watch more violence on TV are significantly more likely to have grabbed, pushed, or shoved their spouses, i.e. domestic violence, and the men are three times more likely to be convicted of some crime. To suggest that the violence we are barraged with on a daily basis contributes to domestic violence might be controversial, 
but I don't think it's far-fetched. Uh, I'm going to say a few words about professional sports. Uh, professional athletes seem to be involved in a proportionally high number of assaults. Uh, you can see the reasons that I've identified. Um, with, with all apologies, this might be photoshopped. Um, <laughs> Michael Vick was involved in a dog fighting ring where a bunch of pit bulls were killed. Yeah, it's bad. I have a dog. I love my dog. The kids love the dog, blah, 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 blah. But it's a dog. The same time this happened, Lamar Thomas took his pregnant fiance and shoved her head through the windshield of his car. That's a person, not a dog. Nothing happened. He lost no playing time, no suspension from the NFL. When Vic came back to play football, people burned their season tickets and him in effigy in front of the stadium. Uh, there's a book called Pros and Cons, Criminal Play in the NFL. Background checks on everybody on the opening day roster. 21% had rap sheets. The most prevalent crime, domestic violence. O.J. Simpson, I don't think I'm going to say a lot about him. Chris Benoit was a uh, family annihilator. Took out the whole family. Michael Pittman, and I can't remember who's currently playing for, played at Fresno State, which is my, the institution in the, in the town I live in. Um, interestingly enough, I know a lot of the PD in Fresno, and there were a lot of instances with girlfriends while he was at Fresno State, all of which got swept under the rug because he was the star player. He's been charged four times officially for domestic violence. His wife said about 30 or 40 more that weren't reported. He finally got the attention of everybody when he took his Hummer and rammed it repeatedly into his wife's Cadillac Escalade while she and their daughter were in it. He got a three-game suspension for assault with a deadly weapon. Chris Brown, um, I find this kid really, really interesting. Uh, he was... Uh, on a show my wife was watching, was a very articulate kid, talked about the pain he went through as a child. His stepfather was an alcoholic, was abusive to his mother, was abusive to Chris and, and his siblings. And he said, having been through it, I, I, I just pray that it never happens to me. And about a year later, it did. Um, and interestingly enough, they're back together. So anybody who know, know who this guy is? Oh, come on. There you go. Steve Adler, drummer from Guns N' Roses, charged with domestic violence in 97. Another guy you might expect. Gary Busey. Yeah, sort of an actor. Uh, an unsuccessful motorcyclist. Uh, two major collisions with head injury and an anti-helmet activist. Uh, joined Promise Keepers after a cocaine OD. OD. Uh, arrested in 99 and 2001 for not keeping his promises. Anybody? Stone Cold Steve Austin, professional wrestler and sometime actor and uh, two-time domestic violence uh, arrestee. Anybody know who this guy is? Vanilla Ice. Yeah, this twink. Um, Robert Matthew Van Winkle. Ice, ice, baby, whatever. Uh, Three-time loser for domestic violence. Somebody you don't want anybody you know to date. You guys ready for this? Yeah, when you roll with Yanni, you're rolling with one bad mofo. Um, <clears throat> This guy used to be CEO of Home Box Office, uh, beat up his girlfriend in 2007. A couple days later, uh, stepped down voluntarily from, from HBO. Yeah, everybody says that. Colonel Sherman T. Potter, the guy everybody loves to love, uh, was, a, was an abuser. Uh, Harry Morgan died last year. Uh, he beat up his wife. Charges were dropped after he completed his domestic violence counseling program. And in fact, m a lot of the people that have been charged with domestic violence have subsequently had their, their charges dropped uh, once they complete their, uh, their edumacation. 
So if you look at the list of celebrities who have sub, been subjected to domestic violence, and I do this not to pick on athletes, not to pick on celebrities. I want to make the point that these are people with every financial advantage in the world. It's not people from the lower socioeconomic, lower educational classes. It's a lot of people all over from every spectrum you want to cut through. Uh, see what else do I want to say? I would point out that Christian Slater has the dubious distinction of being both uh, involved as a perpetrator and as a victim. The ones in light blue are the, the ones that were victims. Uh, briefly, international domestic violence. Uh, we can all think about 9-11 and see the, the pictures. Uh, 106,000 deaths a year in India from, from domestic uh, fires. These are by and large things that are written off as, as kitchen accidents. But brides are doused in kerosene and, and torched in, in discussions over either uh, abuse, disagreements, or dowry problems. Uh, this is a young woman who uh, was married off to somebody she didn't know. Uh, they decided she was talking back too much. This is the girl. They cut off her nose and her ears and, and left her to die and, and got facial reconstruction in the States. So this guy got an award. Uh, he's founder and CEO of the Islamist channel Bridges Television Set. And he got an award for improving American Islamic relations. Good guy, right? He uh, subsequently uh, solved his divorce issues with his wife. She had the temerity to divorce him, so he cut her head off. So back in the health care debate, it came out that there were a number of insurance companies that decided domestic violence was a pre-existing condition and that you could be denied health care benefits if you'd ever been a victim of domestic violence. And in fact, they put it at a greater risk actuarially than, being, than riding a motorcycle or skydiving. So Patty Murray tried to fix that. She was unable to, but the Affordable Care Act uh, sort of ends that practice forever. One of, one of the advantages of the Affordable Care Act. So for those of you that are waiting for me to say Joe Biden is a perp, Joe Biden is not a perp. <laughs> Joe Biden's a hero. Joe Biden was the guy, as a member of the United States Senate, that wrote the initial Violence Against Women Act in 1994. I will point out that the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act has been non-controversial since 1994 until this Congress, and it's been blocked in this Congress from renewal. So if you have any access to your local politicians, I strongly would encourage you to write them and say, get off your ass and reauthorize this. It's important. As I said, uh, and as Ron Chez said, everybody has their index case, their epiphany. Mine's my mom. The facial reconstruction story is kind of interesting to me. Mom was a, a PhD student at that time, and my brother and I came down, and uh, our stepfather said, oh, mom went to the the university early, she had a, an experiment to do. And she wasn't home for dinner. Well, where the hell's mom? Well, she had a, a research meeting. And this went on for about two or three days, and we were getting fairly anxious where the hell our mother was. The story kept changing, and she w we finally got to, mom was in a hospital about 35 miles away uh, that they had been driving. She hadn't had her seatbelt on. There was a dog that ran on the road. He had to slam on the brakes. Uh, it was a 62 Oldsmobile convertible with a metal dashboard, and uh, that's what happened. My brother and I had been in that house long enough to not believe everything we were told, and, and I'll tell you that we went out and looked at the car, and there wasn't a drop of blood anywhere on it, the dashboard, the mats, nothing. Uh, she was hospitalized in a, in a community about 35 miles away in a different hospital than the ED where the abuse had occurred before where she'd been asked about it. As I said earlier, uh, child abuse occurs in about 60% of the wife abuse homes. Uh, one of my brothers got his nose rearranged uh, and has some scars where a plate was broken over his face. 
uh, my scars are not visible. Uh, as I'm talking about it, I'm getting the adrenaline flush, um, and, and I'll tell you the effects are lifelong. So this is an underreported, underrecognized recurrent part of trauma, at least one in five women seeking help in the ED. We frequently screw up and fail to diagnosis. A three question, 20 second screen will improve the identification of these victims, but you gotta ask the question. 13 years ago, the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma came out with a position paper on domestic violence, and they recommended that all female trauma patients be screened. The response to that was crickets. <clears throat> I think every trauma center ought to require that a screening tool be used as part of the H&P or tertiary survey, and, and we do that at our institution. Your trauma PI process ought to include whether or not you actually do it. And there ought to be ongoing education for domestic violence for both trauma and emergency medicine. And I'll make the same offer at this audience that I've made every time I've given this talk. If you can't find somebody else to do, call me, I'll come. Support your local shelter. I cannot tell you how hard it is for women to show up at a shelter for help and get turned away because they don't have enough space. Um, actively support initiatives, collaborate for injury prevention, help your law enforcement out, document what you've got in the record. This Committee on Trauma nationally did a great thing with screening and breathing intervention for alcohol as a requirement. It's in the 2006 optimal resource document. I'll make the argument again that domestic violence victims deserve no less. DV screening ought to be a mandatory part of ACS verification and the college ought to provide national leadership. On this is Mike Rotundo, who's the chairman of the COT, and I like Mike a lot. I put his email address up there. I would invite each and every single one of you to email him, tell him you've heard me give this talk, and, and put in a plea to Mike to make this happen. He really appreciates it when he gets your emails, because I hear back from him. <laughs> um, Mom is doing well. She's living in Northern California. You see her after a hike in Yosemite. Uh, my wife <clears throat> was abused by a boyfriend in college. She's actually got a scar on her arm. She was instrumental in me having the, the courage to talk about this. Uh, so I got to mention her every time because it gets back to her if I don't. <laughs> and lastly, the princess, who's now 14. This was, this was younger. Uh, and so she wants to know when she can date and when she's got good grades and a black belt. Uh, Dr. Mangrum is fond of showing pictures of Sedona. Sedona's nice. This is, uh, this is Yosemite National Park. This is Half Dome. This is about 65 miles out my back door, so there. Thank you very much.